Hello, art lovers. This is Gordy Grundy with ArtReportToday.com. We're going to take you to Los Angeles to the press preview of a new piece of experiential art, the art of the immersive experience of sight and sound. The work is titled A Forest for the Trees. It's been created by artist Glenn Kaino with music composed by David Seidick. This is a production of Super Blue, a new and extremely fascinating effort from Pace Gallery, which we will learn more about very shortly. Correspondent Hunter Drohoyoska Philp will be speaking with Molly Dent Brocklehurst, the co founder and CEO of Super Blue. The interview will be followed by a conversation with Kathleen Ford, the curator of Super Blue. Hunter Drohoyoska Philp is a longtime arts writer for some of the finest publications in the world. She's the author of the fascinating book. Rebels in Paradise, the Los Angeles art scene in the 1960s, which I highly recommend. It's a gas. Let's listen in at this loud and busy press preview as Hunter lobs a question to Molly Dent Brocklehurst. I know that you believe that these events are subsidized by ticket sales, but what, in a larger sense, does it mean for you as uh, someone who's been working in the art world for so long to be working in a non-object-oriented sensibility? I think that the main thing that we're really excited about, that I'm really excited about, is the accessibility. It's creating a much broader accessibility for the artists that we work with. And obviously exhibitions like this, which are really dealing with important ideas, open up a new path for people to have that relationship with artists. Really important and amazing artists that perhaps they never would have if they stayed in the galleries and in the museums as they are. So that's really our kind of our main mission and the thing that I'm most excited about. What do you think about elitism, as it were? I think that's what we're trying to get away from. I mean, 100%. You know, I've I've been at the elitist of the elite for many of my working years, and this is like a big change for me, and it's really, really something I'm excited about. And on a personal level, having been in the elitist of of the elite for so long, what changed for you that you thought this was something necessary in the art world I just think that, you know, that some of the artists that we're working with, some of the artists in general, you know, have got such important voices, and, you know, unlike musicians or filmmakers, you know, they don't get that voice out to a lot of people. And I think that given all the issues that we're dealing with at the moment, having those artists' voices, having that vision of how to create a, a better future, a, a, you know, a seeable future is something that's important in the world. Well, I, I think it's, it's curious to think about artists being willing to be in such huge, complex endeavors, mm-hmm. as opposed to sitting in their studio just dealing with one thing or one material. What kind of artist does that? I think that that's a really good point. I think it is a, a, a kind of a breed of artists. I think often they work in collectives, not, not entirely. You know, Team Lab is a group of 700 people now. Um, you know, a lot of the other uh, artists that we work with are at least two, at least two, if not kind of small studio practices. But obviously there are others as well. But I mean, somebody like Glenn is very collaborative. You know, he has himself, but he also has a studio and a lot of people that he works with. So I think it is artists who, who collaborate uh, are, are obviously the people that we're most likely to be able to engage with, with these sort of multi, multidisciplinary practices and, uh, and opportunities. Now, does Super Blue have a relationship with Pace at all? Super Blue was founded by myself and Mark Lemsher from Pace, so yes. that's the relationship with Pace. And so you know, that continues. That continues. He's one of the, he's the co-founder with me, but and uh, he doesn't work for Super Blue. I do. Um, he's the chairman of the board of Super Blue. So that's the sort of main the main connection. It's independently funded, and um, we do share a number of artists. You do share a number of artists. We do share a number of artists. You know, if there's if there's a kind of a sharing, then Pace would deal with like the object gallery side of it, and we would deal with commissions and these kind of big experiential uh, projects. So that would be now, uh, this is a, you yeah. said the, I think this is the first big offsite thing since Super Blue established in Miami. Is that correct? Super Blue established in Miami a year ago, almost to the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and since then, we've had a couple of projects. We did a project at the Shed in New York last. September, mm-hmm. and we did a project which is just closed in London, a much smaller uh, pop-up show with A.A. Murakami, a collector from Japan and England. So 
uh, this is not the only other thing that we've done, but I'd say that this is the biggest and the most substantial and most um, long-term project that we've engaged with. And uh, so now that Super Blue is up and running in Miami, do you have a schedule of forthcoming events? We have, so we have uh, four exhibitions. We have a, a Team Lab exhibition, a, a beautiful James Terrell um, Gansfeld space, and we have an S. Devlin, and we have um, the Studio Drift piece. We have uh, ideas to create some new artwork, probably in time for Miami Basel next year, and uh, likewise new kind of activations, performances, events, that kind of thing. But the exhibition in and of itself is going to remain for a little while longer. Um, probably change something next year. Marvelous. Now, uh, in terms of Glenn Caino, this is a silly question, but does Pace represent Glenn? They do now. They do now. They did uh, recently. They didn't before. And it's all. It, I noticed they also got an announcement that UTA was representing Glenn Kaina. Not, that's not true. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I don't really know. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, we only do what we do. We're not really. We're not a gallery. We don't kind of try and own anything. We mm -hmm. own the kind of experiential and you know the kind of independent ticket sales world. So we don't. Well, uh, we don't try. We, we're not in the work business of competing with other galleries or artists at the time. Well, of course not. And, yeah. you know, and, and it was, it, is it freeing for you as a gallerist to not be dealing with the actual sales? Or is there a component We've kind of, of sales? evolved into that. So, you know, this, at the beginning we were more focused on sales. But now that we've evolved and we've grown, it is really, we have to deal with the big picture. We can't get involved in, in everything that, that, that goes on. So, you know, we, we work with artists and we, we work very closely with them. But we're not, we're not in, 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 in able to be there for everything. Do you have any any opinions, personal or other, about the sort of escalation of prices in the contemporary art world that seem, well, they're unprecedented, you know, $200 million for a Warhol, wow. you know, <laughs> 900, wow. $195 million for a Warhol. Yeah, that's yeah, impressive. I mean, does, it, does that uh, make you feel that what you're doing is more relevant or does it make you feel like you should be back to selling Warhols? Well, I guess if I wanted to make $195 million quickly, I'd sell Warhols, but I think that this is more important. Hunter now turns her attention to Kathleen Ford, the curator of Super Blue, and their many, many projects. Kathleen Ford talking about what, what are the takeaways of the experience here? What are the first well, things to do? A, a broad takeaway would be to change, feel like you've had a change relationship or kind of a rethinking of your relationship to the environment, the environment around you. And this is everything from the climate, the woods, to the forest, to water. Uh, that's the broad stroke picture. As you'll also see, the show is layered with lots of stories from the Karuk tribe, from music, uh, magicians that are at the top of the field, from a skateboarder, Rodney Mullen, that's at the top of his field, and really pioneers. And they're all telling stories that uh, function in a way as legacy stories and memories and sort of this indication that all of us have this life and legacy and memories that are really important to have. That oral tradition is something important to tell and to, and to not only think about your, a world having a mortality but also having a resurrection. So you'll see various stories that are uncovered in the show. You'll see trees that are resurrected that were once extinct. And so it's a real, I think it's an uncovering of both storytelling, memory, history, and even a resurrection of things in the climate itself. <laughs> well, this is a very, a very ambitious thing for, is, is this, a, is this is your, going to be the model for Super Blue for the future? It's part of what we do. So we have two different strands of what we do, one of which is we have exhibitions that we support within Super Blue proper, and we create find homes for them. And the other side of what we do is we work with partners who come to us or we find each other in some magical way, and they say, we'd love to do something uh, large-scale and experiential. Do you have an artist or artist that you think might be a good fit for us? And that's how it happened with The Atlantic. And so, you did, and, that, and so it's through the Atlantic that you came up with, came, came in touch with Glenn Caino. That's kind of what it we were already working with Glenn Caino. You were okay. Glenn, um, the Atlantic came to me and said, "We have this idea. Um, we want to have establish a new wing of what we do, where artists and other creative people bring the editorial content of the Atlantic to life some way visually. So this idea of visual storytelling." And we, I worked with Brad Gerson, who's the president head of uh, Atlantic Ventures, to kind of come up with a model or a structure of how one of our artists could potentially do that to kind of find a space, 
create their own show and just really listening to them and some of the themes uh, they kept bringing up the, uh, the theme of climate justice and then I was in another year talking to Glenn often and he was starting to tell me about his show that he's working on with Annie at the Hammer that also is sort of rooted in this idea of climate justice and injustice mm -hmm. and I thought well this might be a good pairing and uh, put the two of them together we had a zoom Brad was telling Glenn a little bit about some of the stories that they were working on that year then we brought in Ross Anderson their editor-in-chief and they had more conversations and it just turned out there was a lot of similarities and synergies already in the things that were interesting to them and so through that partnership then we all came together to, to make this happen. Well, that sounds perfect and Glenn has been involved in this kind of thing for such a long time so yeah. that's perfect. And it really is bringing together all of the parts of his practice mm -hmm. from uh, you think about exhibition and uh, discrete artworks, uh, you think about immersive theater and even magic, which there's some of in this show, uh, documentary and film, um, even apps, which he's going to be creating one for, for for this space as well. He's such a vast project uh, practice and he's able to kind of bring it all together under one roof here. Um, even thinking about performance and music, because we will be activating the space with live performances uh, at various times as well. Oh, so stay okay. tuned for that. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll do that then. Thank you. Thank you.